and the chairman's turn, Mr Nick Griffin, MEP. Hello. All right, thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, to follow an explanation as to why I'm so hideously late, apart from, as I've mentioned to a few people already, this must be the only town in the country with two Union roads, which really doesn't help. But um, I've been down in London and the South East with uh, senior members of the Vlaams Belang. This is the, the Flemish Nationalist Party, formerly the Vlaams Bloc, and it was um, the most popular party in the whole of Belgium, and it was banned by the other parties as a threat to democracy which is uh, one of these bizarre things that happens when Liberals are in charge. Uh, so they came back under a new name, the Vlaams Belang. They're very, very good people. We work quite closely with them in the European Parliament. They're very much on our wavelength. Uh, but we hadn't previously really met, uh, we'd only met the people who were in the Parliament and not those who were in the Belgian Parliament. So they've come over, they were over to see what multicultural Britain looks like as it starts to collapse with um, the troubles. So uh, we took them all around the various London hotspots and so on, and then as a, a treat for them today, we took them down to the, the Chatham Dockyard, which is uh, a wonderful tourist attraction if you're ever down in Kent, but you've got to spend a whole day there. It really is worth going. Some really fine naval history. Um, it's a place which was really the heart of Britain's navy for, since before the Spanish Armada, right up until vessels from there were involved in the Falklands conflict, uh, and no sooner had they come home then they closed the yard down. So what was once a yard which made, built nuclear submarines is now a tourist attraction, which rather sums up you know, Britain and the way Birmingham, just up the road, was once the workshop of the world and is now basically a riot zone surrounded by uh, retail parks selling all sorts of stuff made in China. So it's the way the country's gone. But we took them down to this partly as a special treat for them because although they're Flemish, i.e. Belgium, they tend to identify with Holland, so they think of themselves as Dutch. So we took them there because um, it's the place where the Dutch had their greatest victory over the English in 1672 when they sailed up the Thames and the Medway and they burnt the British fleet uh, because at the time the government had so cut back spending on the British fleet, that uh, the ships weren't seaworthy, the men weren't there, uh, and the Dutch were simply able to walk in and burn the lot, helped incidentally by some English traitors who were on their side. So really nothing changes in terms of governments letting our soldiers down and having English traitors. Um, while we were there today, we, right the last two days, had a really good time with them everywhere we'd gone, a lot of people recognise me and they're very friendly, so they're very impressed with that. But of course, once you go into something which is run by uh, officials and people working for the local council and this, that and the other, you get into politically correct world. So we walked into politically correct world. We walked into a place where they've got a special display on about um, the role of ethnic minorities in Chatham Docks and the British Navy, just in case anyone misses the point that we're now a multicultural society, they all got all these poems up um, about how the black slaves felt and how they were exploited. Um, so I said to them, well, here's another reason for so much of the trouble in Britain's black areas, because these kids, especially the young men when they're at school, they're brought up with huge chips on their shoulder about slavery. And the truth is, if you go back to the 16th, the 17th and the 18th centuries, there were far more... English people sent from this country as slaves, as indentured servants, than ever there were blacks involved in this country. So it wasn't slavery, it wasn't a racial institution, it was an economic institution. And if you were bottom of the heap, whether you were black or white, you were quite likely to end up as a slave or as near as damn it as an indentured servant. But I say this is the kind of thing which gives these people chips on their shoulders and then they think, well, we can riot against British society because they owe it to us. So it was one little example. But we were there in politically correct world. So one of the chief women there suddenly spotted me and all hell broke loose. And they came along and they said, well, you can't come in because this is totally non-political. So I said, well, we are coming in uh, because it's against the law in this country to discriminate on grounds of political belief. So for once we get to play the discrimination card, which feels really good <laughs> when you do that, so that we're always the victims of it. Uh, so I said, we are coming in. They said, but... You know, we, we can't have any p political speeches. What, what planet is this woman on? So we brought these people here because it's part of their heritage as well as our heritage. 
and we just want to look around. So anyway, we came in. But they did stress to us we mustn't do anything, and certainly couldn't film anything, which was a shame because when we got to the piece of the display about the Dutch defeat of the English fleet, I was going to read them a Kipling poem that I'd found. Really the greatest poet this country has ever produced. A poet of the common man and of common sense, Rudyard right Kipling. But of course I wasn't permitted to, because we weren't allowed to do anything which might be political. So I didn't do, but I thought um, for the short TV programme that uh, is being put together about their visit, that I'd actually take the opportunity to do this now. So this is called The Dutch in the Medway, 1664 to 72. If wars were won by feasting, or victory by song, or safety found in sleeping sound, how England would be strong. But honour and dominion are not maintained so. They're only got by sword and shot, and this the Dutchmen know. The monies that should feed us, you spend on your delight. How can you then have sailor men to aid you in your fight? Our fish and cheese are rotten, which makes the scurvy grow. We cannot serve you if we starve, and this the Dutchmen know. Our ships in every harbour be neither whole nor sound, and when we seek to mend a leak, no oakum can be found, or if it is, the corkers and the carpenters also, for lack of pay, have gone away, and this the Dutchmen know. Mere powder, guns and bullets, we scarce can get at all. Their price was spent in merriment and revel at Whitehall, while we in tattered doublets from ship to ship must row, beseeching friends for odds and ends, and this the Dutchmen know. No king will heed our warnings, no court will pay our claims. Our king and court for their disport to sell the very Thames. For now do writers topsails off naked Chatham show. We dare not meet him with our fleet, and this the Dutchmen know. And Kipling wrote that before the First World War as a protest at the way in which the enemies of this country were arming themselves faster and faster and Britain was falling behind. And he wrote it about a previous generation when yet again the elite who rule this country were putting the people of this country and especially the soldiers and the sailors of this country at risk by cutting and cutting and cutting our defences. And it was true what he was writing about. It was true when he wrote it. And my God, it's true now. And just the other day, they announced that even as they're talking in terms of doing something towards Syria to get rid of the Syrian problem, the way they get rid of the Libyan problem, while well, they're talking now about far from withdrawing all our troops from Afghanistan by 2014, about probably having advisers there until 2024. So while they're talking about extending our army more and more, they're talking about cuts which could well abolish a third more of the regiments of the British Army, including the Black Watch and the Green Howards. These ancient and noble and proud regiments, and the RAF's being cut, and the Navy's being cut, and they want these boys and girls to do more and more and more with less and less money to the point that this country virtually is defenceless and while people in the recent riots were saying we must bring the army in what both of them and they're both in Afghanistan in any case that's un unfair it's not as bad as that as you know but it's heading that way how can they bring the army in the army's not here the army's being slowly bled and ground to death in Afghanistan in a war that's got nothing to do with Britain whatsoever uh, so there we go. I thought I'd touch on that. It's a shame I couldn't read it for our Flemish colleagues because I'm sure they would have enjoyed it. But um, that's it. So true for hundreds of years, as always, the elite lets this country down. And uh, it's the boys on the front line in the end and their families who are liable to pay the highest price. We're not a pacifist party. We do believe that British troops, they're trained, they've volunteered, they're trained. And if British interest is serious at risk, then we would send British soldiers, airmen and seamen, into battle in defence of the interests of this country with very heavy hearts and if there was no alternative. But I promise you this, we'd never send them into battle with Land Rovers that aren't any use at deflecting improvised explosive devices. We wouldn't send them into battle with guns, with guns that don't work. We wouldn't send them into battle with not enough ammunition to defend themselves if they're surrounded by a mob in a police station in Iraq. We would only send them into battle if we really had to, absolutely properly equipped with the best equipment there is in the world and the best training in the world, and only ever, ever, ever if it's a conflict in which British interests really are at stake. And if any politician wants to send any soldiers to any other kind of conflict, they should simply send their own sons. 
and not the sons of places like Solihull. So, now I want to move on to the main things I want to say tonight. Obviously, I want to talk about the riots. Uh, Now, here, really, right next to Birmingham, we don't need to talk about Enoch Powell and what he said in 1968 and how everybody, really, has known for a generation that Powell was right. Because he didn't say it's going to happen in 1969. He said it's going to start happening sometime in the next century. And he was absolutely right on his... Well, actually, when he said that by the year 2000 there'd be three and a half million immigrants and their descendants in this country, it actually ended up rather worse than that. So he was actually quite an underestimate. He wasn't being alarmist at all. But uh, everybody knows, basically, what he said. And everybody now, yet again, the word's been on everybody's lips. Everybody's lips. Enoch Powell was right. Why didn't they listen to him? So, everybody knows that. You might have seen, if you're on the internet, uh, the speech that I gave in the same hotel that Powell spoke in. He spoke in April 1968, and 40 years later, in April 2008, we booked a room in the same hotel, and Trevor Phillips from the Equality Commission was giving his celebration speech, which was basically, it's okay folks, it hasn't blown up yet. It's rather like uh, if you jump from uh, the top of a tall building, 20 stories up, you could be 17 down and still saying it's been okay so far. But um, So he was giving his celebratory speech in one room and I was giving mine in the other. And uh, we related what Powell had said and then I made a number of predi- predictions and actually said that within three years, I believed, as the economic crisis, which was then just starting to come about as uh, the financial system crumbled, as that struck, I said within three years there will be major riots in this country And the feature of these, I'm paraphrasing here, a feature is that it will involve the communities falling apart in a process that ends up with them behind peace lines, behind walls, dividing different communities. Now, everyone's talking out there in the media in terms of these riots about all the thing is, all the looting and all the burning. No, they've looted and they've burned in every single riot since St Paul's went up in flames in Bristol in 1980. They've done that. What's absolutely new in this is up until now, it was only in Birmingham had the riots involved not ethnic minorities mainly attacking the police and losing people's shops, but this time they involved different ethnic minorities facing off against each other. So that the press have maintained that uh, the Kurds and the Sikhs and the Bangladeshis and the Pakistanis who came out to defend their communities against largely black rioters were sort of public spirited citizens well if they were public spirited citizens then so were the English lads who came out certainly all around London in their groups to defend their communities but of course whereas if you do it if you're a Kurd you're held up as a hero if you do it and you're English you're held up as a drunk and racist thug it's absolutely disgraceful but other than Birmingham a few years ago when they had the riots there between the blacks and the Muslims, nowhere else has it actually come to very large numbers of the members of different ethnic groups standing facing each other, being prepared to fight each other. And that's the new thing in these riots. And it's the thing that took this country that close to the brink of basically an unarmed, in terms of guns mainly, well of course they were shooting at police lines in Birmingham, but a generally unarmed, in terms of guns, low-level civil war. We were that close to that last week, and we all know it's going to come. Whether the flashpoint will be Birmingham, whether it'll be Derby, whether it'll be somewhere in London, it will come. Everybody out there knows it. And um, so, in the media in the last couple of weeks, there's been this cry, well, nobody warned us. Why weren't we warned? Well, of course, they were warned. Powell warned them and we warned them. They tried to put me in prison for warning about these kind of things. But more than that, as a matter of fact, what about the elite? Well, the elite, Labour, Tory, Liberal, they're right. They didn't warn the people. So, do we assume from that they didn't know what was going to happen? No. Because they did warn themselves. This is the thing, actually. It wasn't just us who saw it was coming. The truly awful thing is that the elite parties, the ones in power, particularly the Labour Party, they saw this coming as well. So, if you go back, I was looking on the way up here, in 2003, David Blunkett, then Home Secretary, who's the man with his finger on the pulse of policing and so on. He's getting all the reports. In 2003, Blunkett said that this country's community relations are like a coiled spring. It's going to go poof. 
That's what he said in 2003. Basically, unless we get a grip on youth unemployment, unless we give people decent jobs, and the Labour Party continued importing mass unemployment by importing cheap foreign labour and allowing capital and equipment to go from factory after factory as it closed and was shipped abroad to China. So, he was warning in 2003, he knew what was going to happen, but they didn't change the policies that created it. We've had, since 2003, every single year, 100,000 British Londoners leaving London each year in white flight. Every single year, something like 300,000 mainly Brits leaving this country and 350,000 legal foreign immigrants coming in. Powell was saying we're mad, literally mad, to allow 50,000 a year to come in. And the Labour Party have allowed seven times that number, legally, every single year, for the, what is it, eight years since their Home Secretary said it's all going to go horribly wrong. So they knew, they didn't really tell us. Um, Rear Admiral Parry was the head of the Ministry of Defence's Blue Skies think tank. And in 2006, he gave an astounding speech, which wasn't on any television stations. It was only reported in the Times and the Observer. So it was reported for the political elite, not for the likes of you and me. It was reported for them. And he said that mass immigration, and especially Islamism, are potentially going to create a crisis. In fact, they said, if things aren't changed, if the politicians don't change their policies, they will create a crisis which could create division and disruption and chaos across the whole of Western Europe, Britain included, on a scale matching that of the collapse of the Roman Empire, and it would destroy our civilization. So you've got the, head, the main man of the Ministry of Defence's think tank saying that if the politicians carry on with their present course, this was, as I say, in 2006, he said within five or seven years, it could start a process whereby our civilization will be destroyed by mass immigration and Islam. The political elite got that. It was in the Sunday Times. They all read that. The left-wing political elite, they all read The Observer. That's the Sunday version of The Guardian. No normal people read The Guardian. It's the political elite. It's the left. So they knew. They had the warning. They chose to ignore it and keep on pushing through the crazed policies which created the mess in the first place. It went on. In 2008, there was a special Labour Party conference up in Scotland, again, which was reported in the, um, in the quality papers, not where it would frighten ordinary people, but where the elite tell themselves what's going on. It was reported there, and Frank Field also had a lot to say, MP for Birkenhead, Labour MP, in 2008, about how basically the mass immigration policy and the multicultural policy, it had just about worked when the country was fairly rich, when there was plenty of money to throw out the problems, and everyone really, pretty much everyone, had enough money to get by and they had the car and the fridge was full and they could have their cheap foreign holidays. That's fine. But they warned then in 2008, as the economy turns down, it's going to be totally different. And that community cohesion is going to come under extreme pressure and there's going to be terrible trouble. So they knew that in 2008. And again, they said, unless we create more jobs, and what do they do? They carry on importing mass, immigra mass immigration, mass unemployment to this country and putting our people at the bottom of the heap, at the back of the queue. And for that matter also, most bizarrely, the immigrants they brought in in the 1950s and 1960s, especially the West Indian community, they brought those people in, basically they told them the streets were paved with gold. Well, we know that was a lie. They came in to do the dirty, underpaid jobs that Brits either didn't want to do or they wouldn't pay enough for us to do them. That's why, they bought, that's why they were brought in. But really the deal, if you think about it, was we're going to bring your community in, you're going to do the dirty jobs. The deal was never, you'll do the dirty jobs for 15 years, and then we'll find someone to do it even cheaper than you, and we'll leave you on the scrap heap, and your boys will put through schools where there's no discipline whatsoever, and we'll give them chips on their shoulder about slavery and so on, and we'll just leave them to turn to guns because there's really nothing else to do, and we'll make no attempt to cut down and to restrict the poisonous culture of this rap music where so much of it is about guns and drugs and the casual treatment of women, re repulsive casual treatment of women just as sex objects, we've left them, it's our elite, has left that community with no jobs, high and dry, nothing to do, and their young men with no discipline exposed to that kind of poison. And nothing's done about it. And then they wonder why it goes bang. So, 
they'd done it. And then last year, the Metropolitan Police, there were two things. They held a conference, and again, uh, at the conference, it was down in Bournemouth. And the Home Secretary was there, and they specifically said, unless you give us more money, unless you give us more resources, more men, unless you get our people on the streets instead of filling in forms, unless you do that, and unless you address the underlying social problems here, there's going to be terrible trouble. They warned the political elite, nothing was done. We had a leak from inside, not particularly high up the Metropolitan Police, last, late last year, saying they'd had a briefing, saying that by the end of this year, the impact of the economic downturn and the various problems and having so many young men out on the streets with nothing constructive to do with their lives and no challenges was going to lead to major public disorder, particularly in London. And the British National Party would benefit and something had to be done. That was it. So with all these things, they've known for years now. They've been telling themselves for years it's going to go wrong and they've kept on piling fuel on the fire instead of doing something about it. Because logically, what they should have done is to understand this is their policies that created this. It's not an accident that Britain's become a multicultural mess. It's deliberate policy, not just by the Labour Party. It's by the Conservative Party as well, with the Lib Dems and the BBC, all of them, as you know. It didn't happen by accident. It's a deliberate, calculated design to make our country a foreign country for us and a dangerous country for everybody. So they could have stopped it. They could simply have said, right, we realise it's going to go wrong. Well, we can't undo it all. They say you can't put the clock back. What nonsense. You ever had a clock you can't put back? What use is a clock you can't put back? Of course you can. You can put the clock back if you actually want to put the clock back. What they mean when they say we can't put the clock back is they won't put the clock back. But even if they weren't going to put it back, they could at least say, well, mass immigration has caused this problem. What's the first sensible thing to do? Stop it. Not have any more. We've got an out-of-control fire. Let's stop throwing fuel on it. That would have been a sensible thing to do. If, as they say, they believe that really the recent trouble is because the poor dears don't have any jobs and indigenous Brits are just as involved as the blacks, because that's what you see if you see the BBC the last few days, wouldn't it? If you look at the pictures of the people who have been arrested, a couple of reasons for that. One, black street gangs are streetwise. They don't get nicked very easily. If the cops go to nick one of them, all their mates come to his rescue and they get him away. Whereas some silly left-wing student, white kid, is out there for a bit of fun. He's not streetwise. He's easily nicked. He's not going to put up a fight. He's not carrying a knife. He's easy meat. And they know that it'll please the top people in the police force. It'll please the establishment because they're showing we're not racist. And they're showing that this isn't a racial origin problem in terms of the riots. So um, that's what they've done there. But if they actually believe that it's joblessness and lack of hope which has caused this problem, and actually I'd say to a significant extent it is, because joblessness and lack of hope makes black kids who've got that extra oomph and the chip on their shoulder, makes them want to kick back at society in the same way it makes English boys and Scottish boys and Welsh boys want to jack up with heroin and gradually kill themselves. It's exactly the same thing. It's kids with no hope and no self-respect, and the only thing they've got is their mates, or their drug, and that's it. So yeah, joblessness does have an effect on it, it is part of it. But if the establishment actually believe that, then why have they spent the last five or six years importing hundreds of thousands of cheap Polish workers to take away the jobs that ordinary kids, whether they're black or brown or white, could do and should be doing? So there we are, they're piling the trouble on. They pile the trouble on by... Cameron now saying he's going to declare war on the Human Rights Act. He can't declare war on the Human Rights Act. It's the law of the European Union. And he and his party have signed us up and are quite happy to go along for an ever closer permanent union with the European Union. He can't just do away with bits of it he doesn't like. It's the law of the whole of Europe and it applies to Britain. And Westminster has about as much power as a parish council to get rid of that. All they can do is rubber stamp what comes out of Brussels, and the Human Rights Act has come out of the same stable of um, European Union. They can't possibly do anything about it. But if they're actually serious, they years ago would have said, right, human rights, no. Victims have rights. Criminal scum don't have any rights at all. So we're going to tear it up for the criminal scum. 
and we're going to make it really hard for them in prison and we're going to make them work really hard for their bread and water and a decent meal a day if they finish the work that we're giving them and so on. If they'd done that, people would be too scared to riot. So they could have done that. But, of course, they didn't. They could have done away with peace, the weak PC policing. One of our people was speaking to uh, a policeman in Romford Market just this last weekend when uh, we were camp- people were out there campaigning you know, what we would do about the riots. And this cop said that he was at Haringey where the Kurds and the Turks came out with iron bars to defend their community and their shops from this black mob that was surging up the street. And they chased them down the street. He said he was there and his inspector was in charge and they had plastic bullets and they needed to fire them and the inspector wouldn't let them fire them because he was too cowardly, they said, to become the first police officer on the mainland to give the order to use plastic bullets because they used plastic bullets in Northern Ireland against white Catholic kids and white Protestant kids but they won't use them against black kids in London. They didn't want to do that. So it was too too politically correct to do that. So he wouldn't let them do anything except stand there and be abused and spat at by this mob. He wouldn't let them do anything to stop this mob until the only time this inspector wanted action was when the Kurds and the Turks came out to defend their patch and then he ordered his, his men to go and arrest them. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. And fair play to the police under his command. They simply refused and said it's tea time. And they walked away apparently and they left the Kurds and the Turks to it to defend their area so that patch wasn't touched. Just as down in Eltham, English lads performed exactly the same service for their community in other places as well. It's not a good thing, you know. It isn't a good thing that people have to protect their own community and their own workplace and their own homes because the police should do that. Having people taking the law into their own hands isn't actually good. But when the police don't do it, it becomes people's duty. Every community, including us, we've got the duty and the right to defend ourselves and our community and other people if the police won't do it for us. And then there's one more thing they could have done over the last few years. If they really believed that this country was heading for communal trouble, then they must have known the biggest fault line of all is between the Muslims and everybody else. It's between the Muslims and the blacks. It's between the Muslims and us. It's between the Muslims and the Sikhs. They're the real problem. Well, the answer is to stop immigration from Muslim countries for a start. It's to give them a simple choice. They're either loyal to this country or they're loyal to their religion and their ancestral lands, in which case they can go back to their ancestral lands. And if they want to put their women in burqas... If they want to put their women in burqas, then they can do it in Afghanistan. And no British soldier should die and no British mum should cry trying to stop them putting their women in black sacks in Afghanistan, I don't care what they do in Afghanistan. Even if I cared, it's not our job. It's not our right. It's not our duty to give away our money, our treasure and our boys' and girls' blood to stop them doing what they want to in Afghanistan. But what on earth was happening when all the political elite have spent the last, was it, ten years now saying our boys and girls have to die or be maimed in Afghanistan to secure the rights of women in Afghanistan to have an education. Fair enough, I feel very sorry for them. They haven't got it. But it's for them and their people to sort out, not ours. And they're there so that Afghan women aren't forced to wear burqas. If they were serious about worrying about the burqa, they'd worry about what's going on in Birmingham, where it's used as a deliberate way of flaunting in our face the fact that they're taking over our country. Because there's nothing religious about the burqa at all. It's a political statement of imperialism and a desire to change our society into their society and not just a desire, an actual concrete way of going about it. So that's the problem. That's the place. That's the place the British government should have been saying we're worried about the burqa in Birmingham and not in Afghanistan. But if they were worried about winding up the Muslim community, and let's face it, you know, they're human beings like us. They have their own values. They stick to their values. You have to respect that. Well, then they should have realised that one of the main ways of stopping winding up and radicalising young Muslim men is to stop night after night having on the television. The thing that upsets us, the thing that we remember, is the coffins coming through at Wooden Bassett. 
It's when we hear of another soldier coming home with no arms or no legs or no eyes. We think that's how we visualise it. Put yourself for a moment in the shoes of a Muslim. They don't really see that bit. They think, well, they deserve it. Well, they don't really bother about it. But every couple of days, they hear of a wedding party somewhere, which has been hit by the Americans by accident, and they've killed another 10 or 15 or 20 innocent Afghan civilians in their own country, and that's the bit that they remember. So both communities, us and them, were each remembering a side of that war which has hurt us, which has hurt our people. And if they wanted to stop their community and our community falling apart in ever-increasing loathing, then for God's sake, stop the war in Afghanistan, get our boys and girls out of there, so that we don't have to have the pain and the hurt of Wooden Bassett. Of course, they're getting rid of the pain and the hurt of Wooden Bassett by sending those poor boys' dead bodies through side streets, through back roads, so that the families haven't got anywhere as a focus for their grief and where the nation can show it supports them in their grief. So they're dealing with it like that. But the proper way to deal with it is simply to say, we're leaving. We're leaving now. Afghanistan's your job. You sort it out. Then we wouldn't feel, our people wouldn't feel aggrieved at these Muslim terrorists and the Muslims living here in our midst wouldn't feel aggrieved about us, and particularly our trigger-happy American allies blitzing their wedding parties by accident. Everybody would be far, far happier. But now, you're absolutely right. It's too late. People have asked me, journalists have asked me, they haven't run anything that we said about the riots, but they've come on and asked, well, you know, how would you solve the problem? And you actually have to say, well, sorry, Powell said, we said, this problem cannot be solved anymore. Not in a nice way, not really sensibly, not without taking hard decisions and not without spending a lot of money, you created a problem that aren't any simple solutions. It's too late to stop this mess getting a damn sight worse before we're in a position to make it a lot, lot better. So they've done nothing to defuse the risk, the political elites. They've known for years it's going to be a mess, a disaster, and they simply piled more fuel on the flames. They've done nothing. Actually, that's not quite true. They've done one thing, and one thing alone in that time, especially over the last few years, the deliberate, concerted attempt to murder this party, to kill off the British National Party, to get us out of the way, so that when it all goes bang, as they know it's going to, then there's no one the people can turn to with the tough but responsible, serious answers to give people a real alternative. To point out that, well, we did tell you, and now they created the mess, we warned about it, Please put them out of the way and leave us to sort the mess out. That's all they've done, this attempt to get us out of the way. And I want to touch on that just as briefly as I can. First of all, the most obvious thing was the Equality Commission attack when they came for us over our membership policy, which was there to ensure that just as the Labour Party didn't, wasn't in the end, it was there originally for the British working class And they ended up, as I'm sure you all know, basically being taken over by a liberal left, upper left, upper middle class lawyer mafia who simply forgot that the Labour Party was there for the working class. They forgot why it was formed and it simply became something where Peter Mandelson could say, we're really relaxed about people getting filthy rich. Well, you don't get some people getting filthy rich without a lot of people getting damn poor. So the Labour Party turned its back on its original purpose and we didn't want that to happen and that's a key reason why we said no this party because we live in a multicultural society where everything's for everybody except our people there has to be one party which stands up which is just there for our people not wishing harm for others but it's primarily there for ours there was another reason why we couldn't change it was very hard to change that policy of Brits only in this party and that was that all over the country wherever you go to a British National Party meeting you would find quite a few people there who were there because they or their families had been directly affected by the evil side effects of multiculturalism. People had been mugged. Women who'd been sexually abused and worse at the hands of some of our enrichers. People who'd seen their communities utterly transformed and destroyed. People who'd seen old folk put into homes where no one speaks English. People who somehow or other have been really hurt by what the multicultural society has done to Britain. And yet, here's the political elite saying, 
you, we're going to force you to open your doors to people like the ones who've imposed that hurt on you. You might think, well, perhaps that's fair enough. I don't know. Look at it this way. If there was a self-help group for the victims of rape, so they're all women, and a group of male politicians came along and said, this is discrimination against men. You must have men in these meetings. Then you understand how monstrous it is if the women say, no, we've been raped by men, even though most men out there, of course, they're not rapists. Of course, most men aren't rapists. But nevertheless, we don't want men in the group where we're talking about the things that have happened because of some wicked men, the tiny minority of wicked men. You can see how awful that would be if the state used its power to say, no, you're bigoted women, you've got to have men there. It's exactly the same thing they've tried to do with us, when what is basically, to an extent, a self-help group for people who've been really hurt, physically and mentally, and really scarred by the evils of multiculturalism, and the evils of the way the police and the political elite have lost control, that we have to have people here who remind our people of the perpetrators. Sickening. Really sick. But that's what they set about doing to us. And as you know, in the end, we complied to a degree, but not without a hell of a fight, and not without first putting into effect all sorts of defensive measures so that the actual aim of this couldn't come about, because the aim was made quite clear by uh, Simon Woolley of Operation Black Vote. Can you imagine Operation White Vote? funded by the taxpayer, there'd be hell to pay. But Operation Black Vote, fundamentally racist. Fundamentally racist, because if you have two different groups and you encourage the voting level of one group, you're automatically disadvantaging the other and ensuring that the group which is having its voting strength artificially boosted is going to get more crumbs from the cake. It's going to be the squeakier hinge. It's going to get more oil. It's a racist policy financed by taxpayers' money. And Simon Woolley of Operation Black Vote who's also a member of the Equality Commission, said quite blatantly on national television, we're going to get into the British National Party, we're going to flood it, and we're going to close it down or change its policies. So destroy it. So make no bones about it, that was a deliberate and calculated effort with 70 taxpayer-funded lawyers against our little party designed not just to mean that one or two coloured people could come into our meetings. I've actually got a problem with that. Never really did have, if the people at the local meeting were happy with that. And some were, and some weren't. And where they weren't, then we were absolutely committed to stand by our people's rights to make their own choice as to who they do and don't associate with. It's a fundamental human right. It's something which actually, when the time is right, we're going to go back to court with these people and we're going to secure that fundamental right because they've broken the law and they know it. But for the time being, our aim was simply to survive that attack and we did survive. So, they knocked us down, we got up, and we're battling back. And then, since, particularly since we were elected to the European Parliament, we've had a concerted effort from the media simply not to mention us. We've been disappeared. And I've had, as a consequence, people, constituents, saying, well, we are a bit disappointed, we still support you, we're a bit disappointed that we haven't seen you on television, why haven't you got out there to tell them like it really is? We've given you the mandate to speak. Well, questions at the end, otherwise we'll get sidetracked. But keep, keep it with you. We've given you the mandate to speak. Why haven't you used it? And I have to explain. Well, I can't say, look, excuse me, I'm, getting, I'm on TV now. You know, I'm on the BBC. I'm going to gate crash it next week. It doesn't happen like that. They invite you or you don't go. So we've been effectively silenced. Question time. I was put on that. And as you know, it was a lynch mob. And... The BBC rules were that we should be on, they told us, we should be on twice a year. It's over two years now, and I've been on once, which wasn't question time at all. It's the first time in 35 years when they came up with a different format. And so they now owe us three question times and a rematch. So they owe us four. But they said, no, you can't have it, because polling evidence indicates that your support has slipped. Yes, one of the reasons for that is that we're not on question time. Because if we were there to, on question time, talking about our answers to all the problems, the public would be watching it and thinking, bloody hell, I thought they were just anti anti-immigration pressure group, but actually what they say on crime and the rights of victims must come before the rights of criminal vermin. 
and about getting us out of Europe and about rebuilding British industry with apprenticeships for people instead of spending money on stupid foreign wars. The public would see things like that and talk about it and our support would rise. But oh no, the BBC decide, no, they can't have us on. So there's a deliberate silence about us. A parallel with that, a deliberate artificial boosting of UKIP with Nigel Farage on as the soft face of British nationalism. He's not a nationalist at all. He's an internationalist, he doesn't like Europe. He's right on one thing and one thing only. But uh, he's promoted relentlessly on BBC TV and radio. He's virtually never off question time. And parallel to that, that's on the soft side of the party, on the sort of hard side, the relentless promotion, especially in papers like um, the Express and the Star, of the English Defence League. Basically good lads, but something that's going nowhere, something that actually has some very strange connections right at the top. Something which isn't English nationalist at all. It simply has a thing about Islam. Fair play, that's right. But when they say that any Tom, Dick or Harry or two le two-legged featherless thing that walks into this country can be English. No, they cannot be. Because English is a matter not just of what you are and your parents are. It's about your culture. It's also about your blood. And they may be very nice people. They may be honorary Brits. But if they can be English, what are we? If anyone can be English, to be English means nothing. So it's a phony thing, that. But it's boosted up by the media to take you know, the younger, more excitable lads away to take them out of our political orbit, to get them out there basically doing daft things. So it's quite deliberate. And then, I'll be as brief on as this as I can, there has been a concerted campaign of internal subversion against this party. I want to best actually illustrate it, not by talking about the British National Party, but what was done to its predecessor as a nationalist voice in this country, the National Front. Now don't for one minute think I'm talking about the National Front as it is now, which is basically a small gang of elderly, larger-swilling ex-football hooligans. I'm talking about the National Front as it was in the 1970s, which was a decent organisation of decent men and women of all ages and backgrounds in this country who were desperately trying to warn about and organise to do something about the disaster that was being pushed on this country by our political elite. Uh, and, you know, it's not politically correct to say it, but I'm proud to have been in the National Front at that time, and I'm proud that the British National Party has a number of people who were as well, because it was a very decent, lawful party which was hugely sinned against, and sometimes as a result, its leadership made bad decisions, and they got involved in a cycle of confrontation with the left. It was a stupid thing to do, but it was done with a good heart and a good spirit, and it was consistently a party which was attacked rather than was an aggressor. And the National Front was taken apart in 1979, and there was one man in particular called Paul Kavanagh, who was a businessman, apparently. And he came along and he got involved, uh, and because he was a businessman, they put him in charge of the, uh, the running, or rather the acquiring of the party's headquarters, called Excalibur House, out in north-east London. And um, in the end, he ended up coming within a whisker of taking it away, and walking away with it, and he devastated that party by building up a faction which just told lie after lie after lie about the leadership, whether it was well, the various leaders, the people there. People ended up convinced that the party treasurer, every week, went to the party staff and gave each of them their wages, plus a bonus, in envelopes marked members' hard-earned cash. Ha-ha. Outrageous. Outrageous lies against people who are working really hard under really difficult circumstances to build a nationalist alternative to the corruption of the old parties. And Kavanagh took that apart. And people used to say, oh, poor Kavanagh's OK. Yes, he's able to spend all his time doing politics because he has an engineering business. And he runs machine tools and he particularly sells machine tools. And that was his business. It was a front. One youngster in the party at the time got a job a summer, summer job, working the switchboard in his factory. Uh, which wasn't very bright, actually, Mr Kavanagh, because he was on the side of the party and not on Mr Kavanagh's side. And um, he reported back, and he said, it's a strange thing, you know, but I've been on the switchboard all summer, and I haven't had one call about the business. The man is making his living selling machine tools, but all summer, no one has phoned, and in those days, Britain still had a use for machine tools, rather than just a scrap, or somebody shipped to Nigeria. 
Not one call. Because it was a front. It was a hoax. The man was put in by someone to take that party to pieces and he did a very good job. Not long after that also got involved a man called Ray Hill who wrote a complete book about he was work, how he was working for the far left and how he got involved in nationalist party after nationalist party and each one, the aim and the, most, the, the method was to tell lies about people in the leadership to accuse them behind their backs of theft and fraud and fiddling and incompetence and then take good-hearted people, sincere people and because he was telling them something and one of his mates was telling them the same thing they came to believe it and they tore party after party apart in the same way. Good-hearted people listen to this poison and because we're trust trusting people they think, well, that fellow's bought me a drink once and I've seen him go out leafleting once or twice so he must be telling the truth. So it's believed. And Ray Hill tore several nationalist parties apart and then wrote an autobiography with his organisation Searchlight boasting about how he'd done it. And just go and read it and so on and understand exactly the same things being done with the British National Party. Why wouldn't it be? Because the National Front never got a single councillor elected. We've got dozens upon dozens of councillors elected in different places at different times. We won seats to every single level of government in this land except the Westminster Parliament. Every other level we've won seats and we still hold seats at every other level. Why on earth would the far left and the police intelligence service go to all the trouble of wrecking the National Front in 1979 and 1980 when it had never got a single parish councillor elected and then leave us alone? Can you believe that? It's, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? Of course it's incredible and it hasn't happened because they haven't left us alone. There's this, been deliberate, this deliberate attempt to destroy this party from within. Just briefly, another thing. Last year, mainly, there was, and earlier this year, there were a number of cases where policemen, undercover plainclothes policemen, have been put into the environmentalist group, the so-called crusties, these green cranks who actually believe that uh, global warming is going to drown polar bears and therefore we must close down coal-fired power stations. I'm not going to get into that particular story. We hear, you know, it's another whole speech, it's another issue. But um, those people are only holding protests outside power stations. At the very worst, those protests sometimes involve a small number of policemen getting injured in the pursuit of their duty, which is a bad thing, and it should be dealt with by the police being allowed to get tough with people. But nevertheless, the environmentalist movement is never going to destabilise the existing status quo. It's not going to be turned to by ordinary people because when they tell ordinary people yep, we're going to double your car tax and double it again and we're going to put, get, put more tax on fuel and we're going to force you to do all sorts of things. We're going to take away your opportunity to have a cheap holiday in Spain to get away from it all by putting enormous carbon taxes on airfares and so on. When the public actually hear what these green cranks want to do they've got no possibility of getting support. They're a small isolated sect who are no threat to anybody really accept themselves. And yet the police, it came out absolutely crystal clear, were putting people into these organisations, not just to spy on them, but also to set them against each other, to tear those organisations apart, to destroy them. Is it actually possible that the British Secret Service, the British Police Force and so on, would go to all that trouble against a group of green cranks who are never going to destabilise anything and leave us alone when we're respected hugely admired by millions of people who've had it up to here with a multicultural society and are desperate for an alternative and they're thinking about turning for us but they're not quite sure because the BBC has said nasty things about us but they're on the point of coming and looking at us for themselves where our website for the last eight, nine years now has been more popular than the websites of all the other political parties put together and in the last week or the week after the riots it went up nearly 100% in terms of its hit rate. So from a hugely high base, it doubled. From what weren't really big riots, those weren't big riots, you know. They were shopping with violence. They were looting with a little bit of rioting. They were groups of 40 or 50, youngsters mainly, causing all sorts of terrible mayhem because the damn stupid police let them because they're too politically correct to actually do anything about it. There's no comparison between that and the riots they had in Lazelles in 2005, between the blacks and the Muslims. There's no comparison between what we've just seen and actually what happened in Brixton 
and various other parts of Britain in 1981 and 85 and 86. Those were riots involving whole communities, involving hundreds of petrol bombs being thrown at the police every hour, involving the police <coughs> being driven out of areas which were then looted, instead of this time just standing around while a few overgrown kids looted. That's real trouble. That's what's coming. The police know that's what's coming. And yet, some people would say it's um, alarmist or conspiratorial to say that the police would not simply leave the British National Party intact and unaffected. Of course, they want to get us out of the way, the police and the whole political elite, and that's what they've been doing. This concerted attempt to destroy this party through waves and waves and waves of the most appalling lies against the people, myself included, who've carried this party forward, but many colleagues as well, it's a fact, and it's been done by our enemies to destroy this party. And also, it's failed. We're still here. We're not supposed to be here, you know. I'm not supposed to be here. You're not supposed to be here. We're supposed to have been crushed, either from without or broken up from within, and we are still here. That's a huge achievement. It really is. It's a fantastic thing. It's not just... Down, it's not particularly down to me, it's down to people like Alwyn, it's down to the rank and file people at grassroots level, it's down to Jeff Dickens over there from the East Midlands, who stuck by this party, who stuck by its proper system, and have said, yeah, if you've got problems with the way the party's run, fair enough. Alwyn had problems with the way the party was run in various ways. He stuck with the party, and we put those things right, and that's it. And if someone comes to me with a problem, or something they don't like, we can talk about it. We can put it right. What's wrong is when people take the problem and go all over the internet with it. When they go to the BBC with it. There's a big smear programme coming out at the end of next month. All the same stuff that we've all heard for the last couple of years. It's going to be all over the BBC in another attempt to break this party. I tell you, that one will fail as well. Because this party is a very, very tough party. It's a party with a lot of people with a lot of common sense. Just one more aside, another example of this. Arthur Scargill, remember him? Yeah. Now I've got no great time for Arthur Scargill although in the end it wasn't him who destroyed the British coal industry it was Margaret Thatcher but, Mark, but Arthur Scargill's stupidity in not having a democratic ballot to decide to have a strike gave Thatcher the chance to win and to destroy this country's mining community and this country's mining capability and yes some pits were worked out and they needed to be closed and if a union was going to oppose that, to oppose that, that union needed cutting down to size. But that wasn't what that conflict was about. It was about destroying this country's coal resources or our ability to get them out. And Scargill said that. And on that point, Scargill was right. And he went about it terribly wrong. But if you look now at what Scargill was saying and what Thatcher was saying, Scargill was right and Thatcher and co. were wrong. But during that conflict, Scargill was hit by wave upon wave of smears about how he was siphoning money from the Union into his own private bank accounts, about how he had money from Colonel Gaddafi, about how he was a fraud. They even went to the point of producing forged bank statements to show that Scargill had his hands in the members' pockets. She didn't. He's a Marxist crank and a dangerously anti-British fanatic, but he wasn't a crook. He was one of those men who actually, there are a few of them left in the old Socialist Party, who actually believed at that time that they and their men were brothers. He was one of those people, like a few of the Labour MPs, who even to this day still only take the average industrial wage and give the rest back to their community. Scargill was like that. He's now living and retired in a nice grace and favour mansion. He's doing all right for himself, old Arthur. But nevertheless, he was, although misguided and wrong, he was sincere, and he certainly wasn't a crook. But if he believed everything that was put in the papers and BBC Panorama, he was. But it was another wave of attacks aimed at demonising and getting rid of someone the British establishment didn't like, just like us. And that's what's been going on against this party for the last couple of years. And it's done us a lot of damage. You know that. I know a few of you are new. So perhaps some of this, well, I'm sorry if it's been a bit boring or not quite what you expected, it needs saying. It needs saying to people, and especially the people who you know, have been around, who've seen us through this. It's done us a lot of damage, those attacks. We're now in the rebuilding stage. All over the country we're growing. Because of the riots we're growing, even before the riots we're growing. 
We did get ourselves, not least because people were saying, don't give money to the party. We were in terrible debt. We're not in terrible debt anymore. We've surmounted this problem. This party is going to go forward. And every one of these attacks has failed thus far, and they'll continue failing. Because this party is a tough party. Because the British people, it's us, we're a tough people. We're very slow, you know, to get going. But once our backs are against the wall, then time and time again through history, the people of this nation do get up and stand up and fight for their rights and their community. And we do in the end win. And we're going to again this time because the whole political establishment is exposed not just by the failure of their multicultural system and the riots, even bigger than that. It's one last thing. Think about looting. On everything that the looters have cost this country, all of those looters, whether they're disaffected young blacks or greedy and stupid English chavs, whatever they are, what those looters are taking from this country is a tiny little fraction of what the banks have looted from this country and what the political elite have allowed the financial centres of the world to loot from this country. And they're utterly discredited, not just by the failure of their multicultural experiments, but by their economic policy, which has reduced this country over generations from being the workshop of the world, from being the place that invented the modern world, to being a pauper state, a bankrupt slum. That's what the political elite have done. That's what the British people are understanding. It's why at present, fewer and fewer people vote. There'll come a time very soon when the pain of the economic crisis that's now enveloping this country will be so great that people will have to become political again. They'll have to start asking questions again. They'll have to start wanting to make a change again. And when they want to make that change, we by that time will be organised enough and large enough and powerful enough and capable enough and wealthy enough to be there to offer an alternative. We are going to do it because this country is not simply going to slip into the night and fade away because this is a great country. This is a wonderful country. We love this country. We're not ashamed to, do, to say so. And with your help, we are going to get it back for us, for our children and for future generations of our people in our land. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah.